Good evening again, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you guys are all enjoying your delicious dinner, courtesy of the kind folks at La Bottega. Um, yeah, so if you didn't realize, if somehow you wandered in and bought a ticket, this is the April 2014 meetup the WordPress Cape Town community. I just want to uh, say thank you to our sponsors for this evening. You can see some of the banners there around the venue. Uh, Payfast, thank you guys very much. Give Payfast a hand, everybody. <laughs> Payfast, it's me, it's a name. As well as the, the guys from WooThemes, WooThemes.com. Give them a round of applause as well. All right, uh, just before I introduce our speaker for this evening, I want to give you guys an opportunity to Go and grab seconds if you want. Uh, it is a buffet, which means that uh, don't be shy. I know some of the guys looking at me now with a knowing, knowing wink in their eyes. It's alright, you can have seconds, it's a buffet. Go loud. Don't be, don't be ashamed. Um, I am going to take this opportunity while you guys do that, and while our guest Maria is going to start getting set up. Uh, hi, how are you? <laughs> Uh, I have a little save the date for you guys. Uh, you guys can pop this into your iPhones or your calendars. It's for WordCamp 2014. How many of you guys were at WordCamp last year? It was a pretty rad event. Cool, quite a lot of you guys, that's awesome. The good news is uh, that it will be taking place at the... Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. Better than the Journal of Jamboree, I'm telling you now. It's true. WordCamp Word 2014 is going to be even better than 2013. It's going to be at the Cape Town Stadium again. Awesome, awesome venue, as I'm sure you guys who were there last year will agree. Uh, the date that you guys have to pencil down is the 23rd of October. 23rd of October, WordCamp 2014 here at Cape Town. Joel, you're excited, aren't you? There we go. Woo. Uh, tickets will be on sale a little bit later in the year. This is just a heads up, sort of save the date for you guys again. So uh, please make a note of that. Um, also, on another note, related to WordCamp, if any of you guys want to get involved or know someone who would like to either help sponsor the event or speak at the event, please get a hold of us. Uh, we have the most dashing Jack Parrow lookalike apparently over here. His name is Hugh Lashbrook. Uh, please get a hold of Hugh. Uh, you can go speak to him afterwards or uh, uh, drop him a line and he will sort you out there. Right, you guys having a good time so far? It's alright? Yeah. You guys seem very quiet. <laughs> the guys on the road are making more of a noise than you guys. That's just why I'm, I'm just wondering. It's fine, you guys can rev your cars on the way out. That's, that'll, that'll be good as well. Um, we do have an awesome guest speaker here tonight for you guys. She's come all the way from Israel, which is pretty epic. Uh, her name is Miriam Schwab, and uh, she describes herself I'm quoting you here as a friendly co-CEO and founder uh, of a company called Luminaire in Israel. So friendly co-CEO, that's quite nice. Do you think a lot of CEOs are not often like a bit rude and, and mean to people? Oh, really? Oh, cool. I don't want to spoil the talk then. I, oh, I was just wondering. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Maria as well as uh, what she does, in case some of you don't quite know. Uh, like I said, she founded, she founded hmm, Luminaire after giving birth to her fourth child. Wow, that's pretty amazing. Uh, she wanted more flexibility and room for creativity in her work. Uh, and her company, Luminaire, is a leading WordPress uh, development agency in Israel. Uh, they've done over a hundred WordPress websites, which is pretty flippant awesome. She knows her way around. Uh, they focus on creating effective and engaging websites as well as marketing campaigns for a wide variety of clients. Um, she, uh, she also has her finger in other pies as well. She serves on the steering board of Digital Eve, which is Israel's largest professional women's network. Uh, it's a non-profit volunteer organization, and they have over 3,100 members who share knowledge and resources uh, every single day. That's pretty cool. Uh, she also blogs about WordPress, because as if she didn't have enough time. She's uh, diversifying even more. She blogs about WordPress, social media marketing, and uh, SEO as well, which I know is also a passion of hers. Uh, over on a site called wpgarage.com. So you guys bookmark that to go check it out when you get home as well. Uh, Miriam also, she's a regular speaker at conferences around the world. Uh, we're very privileged to have her here in Cape Town tonight. Is this your first time here in Cape Town? Awesome. 
So uh, yeah, she's going to be talking to us tonight. Her talk is about running a successful WordPress business. Um, so I want you guys to please greet Maria Miriam very uh, warmly. Give her a proper South African welcome, a good Cape Town welcome. Make her feel at home. Please, uh, I'd like you guys to welcome the lovely Miriam Schwab. Sorry guys, I forgot to mention that uh, there will be a short Q&A after Miriam's talk and we will be giving away two tickets to WordPress uh, WordCamp 2014 to two of the best questions, so start thinking now while she's talking. And uh, yeah, back to Miriam, thank you. Thanks. Hi, um, it's great to be here. Just so you know, I didn't fly all the way here to speak, <laughs> particularly specifically for this. Um, we came to Johannesburg actually to spend the upcoming Jewish holiday of Passover with my in-laws. My husband's originally in South Africa and he's here. So I haven't been here in almost 10 years and uh, I decided because the last time we flew, we flew with four kids and they were all small and I needed like therapy after that. And so I said, if you want to see the grandchildren, you come to Israel. So that's how it was for many years. But now my oldest is 15 and uh, you know, if you have a few older kids, they can help you. So, um, so we came, and it's great to be here. And when I knew we were coming, I also knew I wanted an excuse to get out of Joburg for a little bit. No offense to Joburg. I hope nobody here is particularly, you know, connected in that way. But um, I don't love Joburg, and I know that Cape Town's beautiful, or at least I heard that, and I never had the opportunity to come here. So I reached out to Woo Themes, and they said, I said, you know, can I just come down and meet you guys? I was like, oh. You know, just get me out of Joburg, and anyways, I wanted to. And they said, hey, well, we're going to have a meetup. You want to come speak? And I was like, oh, totally. So um, it gave me an excuse to get out of Joburg and also get away with my husband. We're here without the kids. My in-laws are hopefully managing. <laughs> so, um, so, that's, so that's why I'm here, but it, it's really great. And um, it's such a nice crowd. I, we have meetups in, in Israel, and I don't think we get this many people. It's, um, we get a word camp. Uh, my company is the local organizers of the WordCamp conferences. Um, next one's coming up May 27th in Tel Aviv. Uh, we get about 200 to 250 people, but um, at the meetups not so much. So I think it's great that you guys are active and interested and that you come out to these things. So um, being that I haven't been here for so long, um, you know, it's like kind of like looking at the country with new eyes. And I, uh, I'm so impressed with so many things here. It's just, it's a wonderful country. It's beautiful. People are so nice and friendly and nobody's yelling at us when we're driving on the roads. In Israel, everyone's always yelling at everyone. Why did you do that? And why aren't you over there? And it's all very offensive. And here, nobody's yelling at us. And this, I'm going to show you a picture of something that I took this morning that really impressed me. I sent this to my family and I said, what do you think is so impressive about this picture? Okay, this is in the airport in Joburg. This is um, where I was waiting to get uh, to go through the next stage after I checked in. So this is just a lineup without barriers around it, down the hall, very long line, and everyone's standing in line, one person behind the other, nobody's pushing or trying to go in front of the other person, and there's no shouting, and everyone's just standing in line like that. It's like a miracle. So <laughs> I'm like, wow, this is so polite and so wonderful. Like my sister wrote back, she's like, dreamy it is. It's, <laughs> it's really, so <clears throat> it's really nice to, you know, I love Israel and everything, but it's nice to not have to like elbow my way through everything, you know, for once. <laughs> so, uh, so it's great to be here. So, um, just I, you introduced my talk as uh, running a successful WordPress business. I'll just put successful in quotation marks because um, what is a successful agency? It's one, at least in my opinion, that like survives and gets to do great stuff. But um, I feel uncomfortable calling us successful. Yes, we've been around for eight years and we've done a lot of great stuff um, and worked with great clients, but we also have a lot of hardships and we have them and we don't have them and we have them again and it's not so easy. But having done this for eight years, I have learned like something, a few things, and so I'm going to share that with you tonight. Um, 
So he introduced me already, which was very embarrassing. Um, we had clients in five continents, they had eight years, uh, okay, and 100 plus websites. This is just um, our gang now. We have seven kids now. <laughs> so um, that's, that's who's back in Johannesburg with the Wow. Yeah, so uh, it's a little bit hectic, and that's an understatement. So anyways, I'm going to start off by talking about diversifying our services. So uh, when we're WordPress agencies, our core business is generally building WordPress websites, right, for clients. They come, they say they need a site, and then we start the project, and we end the project, and then we say bye-bye, and then that's the end of that. And um, for anyone who's running a business of this type, where you have once-off projects that start and end, you'll know that it's very difficult in terms of uh, projecting cash flow, you know, what is your revenue going to be, and um, let's say, for, in a, in, for example, with us, our current payment structure, which I think I'm going to change, is based on milestones. Um, and you know, sometimes we can get to design stage where the client can't decide between shades of blue for like four weeks, and you know, you're stuck with this project in your pipeline, in your workflow, you can't necessarily give that project manager another project because they have that on their head. We call it headspace. Like these things that just take up headspace, even though they're not doing anything, but you can't forget them because the client can reappear at any moment. Um, so this particular business is actually really difficult, unfortunately for us. Um, it's needed on the one hand, there's a reason that agencies exist, yet it's very, very difficult. So um, one thing that I'm trying to do constantly and uh, sometimes more successfully and sometimes less successfully is to add um, complementary services to what we offer, particularly ones that um, involve recurring revenue. Because recurring revenue is the best. You know it's coming in, you know what your revenue is going to be for the next while, you can project at least based on that. So this is, this is how I feel looking for new projects, really. Like it's like a race. You know, and uh, new leads come in, proposal goes out, and, and then they want to negotiate like five billion back and forth, right? Like, oh, can you change the timeline, can you do this, can you do that, and that, and mild payment terms, and oh, it's just, just that takes so much time. And that's why recurring revenue, you get to kind of, you sign them on once, and then that's it, as long as they're with you. So how, how are some, this is, um, yeah, I just, this is what our revenue could look like sometimes. Uh, the blue line is recurring. The nice, constant, you know, I know what's going to happen kind of line. And then the red line is our project, and literally it can look like this, which is insane, right? We, we literally have these like crazy spikes up and down in terms of when actual revenue comes in. So um, this is the breakdown of our services today, uh, where most of our revenue is WordPress sites. Um, but what I really want to expand and, and I've been working on is to get to something like this where the WordPress hosting and maintenance um, becomes a bigger part of the pie. And uh, that is actually something that's in very high demand. Um, WordPress has advantages and disadvantages. We know what the advantages are. It's you know, easy to use for our clients and it's flexible and you know, it's in it, we're in it for the long term because of the community and everything. You could pretty much guarantee clients that five, ten years down the line, the community will still be around and WordPress will still be developed. Um, but once the site launches, inevitably, our clients need help with something. You know, they add a widget to the sidebar and the whole thing breaks, or they add a plugin and something breaks, or just something breaks. You know, that happens just so often. And they can't handle that. So we get them into an ongoing monthly um, like retainer for support. Now, I learned a very, very difficult lesson in the last two months. So here you can see, I call it hosting and maintenance. And we're actually going to stop with the hosting side of things. We started with hosting because um, I felt like, and, and this was actually how it was, like clients aren't gonna sign up for maintenance because they're not aware that they need the maintenance but they are aware that they need hosting. So the hosting was an excuse, um, and that would get them into it. And then as the time went on, they would really see the benefit of having the maintenance, especially also with upgrades and things like that. You know, they're not always on top of things, and, um, and it was important to have someone else doing that, and backups and that. But um, we've had such a nightmare with hosting. I don't know about you guys, but hosting is like the bane of my, exi my existence by now. It's really, like, we're, we're losing sleep over it. It's so bad. We, um, we had a dedicated server with HostGator, 
and then it just and, and there's supposed to be some kind of managed hosting there and it just became a disaster. The sites were all loading slowly. Turned out we were being, I actually started a conversation on, on one of the WordPress LinkedIn groups, which some of you might have seen, um, about the real problem with WordPress security, right? Our clients come to us and often they're, they say their concern is security. Um, we hear that WordPress can be hacked and we say, well, we do a few things that prevents our client sites from being hacked. And really, thank God, our client sites do not get hacked. Um, you know, we remove the admin user, and we make sure that they use strong passwords and uh, I don't know, some other things. And, uh, and they're fine, but what's the problem? At one point we were getting a million hits a day to our clients' WP login.php pages of all these bots trying to hack their sites. So they would enter admin a billion times, and, or at least tr try to call the page, and just that <laughs> activity was slowing everything down and making the sites impossible to load and it was just a nightmare. And HostGator couldn't stop it. Uh, we've just a tip that um, it's really easy to implement and uh, to make a big difference. Move your wp-login.php uh, page right from the beginning. Um, just like for years we always made sure to remove admin, this is, the, this is now something that I really recommend you guys do because WordPress sites are so easy to hack that these bots just go out there looking for this page and they know where to find it. So A, move it to somewhere else, to a different location, and B, um, we started blocking um, countries to that page. Like if our, in many cases, our clients are just, the ones who are accessing the admin of the site are just in Israel, or let's say in the is Israel and the US, and then we block everywhere else. Why do people in Pakistan need to have access to that? And so that stops the PHP calls, and that also helps with the server issue. So um, that's, my latest server nightmare, and we moved to another server, a hosting provider. Um, I don't want to say them who they are because they're kind of new, and like I really do hope they succeed, but they also suck. So <laughs> it's really bad. <laughs> I'm really looking for that, you know, golden something, but I haven't found it yet. So in in any case, what I'm considering now is saying to all our clients, listen, just go get your own um, account on WP Engine own personal one, no like agency type of thing, and we will then maintain your site and give you support. And WP Engine will support the hosting side of things. You know, that's seriously what I mean. So it's just so you all know, hosting's just, oh, if you want to have a life, try not to get into it. Okay. Um, clients and chemistry. So who is your ideal client, right? That's something that's really important to ask yourself. Um, there, there is something to, to be said about having like a goal, planning something or idealizing something and aiming for it. And then, you know, in many times you can, in many cases you can achieve it. So you can say, who are your ideal client? Who's your ideal client? Um, what are the factors? So of course there's budget, which is, I'm just gonna be down here for a second. Cause <laughs> I have to, no, it's okay. I'll just, this is one of those slides. Um, budget, right? We all want to get paid what we're worth and I'm gonna talk about that later. Um, industry, you know, you might choose to, to be in a niche. Let's say you choose to particularly work with nonprofits or finance or, or startups or something like that. Um, so you might want to become experts in an industry. Referrals, um, word of mouth is seriously the best way to get business. It's easiest to close. When they come to you from a good recommendation, they're like 80% closed because they feel confident in your abilities and they trust whoever recommended you, and it's very difficult to be able to pick someone out of the crowd and feel confident going with them. So referrals are like the best. Um, what's their timeline, right? Like now with the Passover holiday coming up, all these people, I don't know why in Israel, they're all waking up now right before Passover, they're also going on holiday. They're all like, we need sites now. And I, I said to them, like, there is no way. After, after Passover, we will talk. Um, mensch, mensch is a, a Yiddish word. Uh, which actually means person, but what it really means is like a human being. So we none of us want to work with people who are not nice and you know difficult. And um, it's something that's difficult to um, know when you first meet clients, but you can try to see it. And it's really important because if you sign on someone who you had a bad feeling about and and you were right, then they really can suck your will to live. So um, you need to avoid that, and they, they will end up taking too many of your resources as opposed to your good clients, your nice clients, you know, your more profitable clients. So it's, it, on the one hand, you can't always, we've signed on people who I was like, oh, we're all gonna suffer, and then they were totally fine. 
And then we signed on people who seemed sweet and as honey, and then they just ended up sucking our will to live. So it's hard to tell, but you really want to try to, uh, to identify that from the beginning. So even with all that, you can end up um, with unhappy clients. And I just want to give you a case study, an empirical case study of why you shouldn't always take it to heart. Yes, we all want to provide the best possible service, but um, even with all that effort, sometimes it's just not meant to be, and sometimes it really is a matter of chemistry. So we worked on two projects um, about six months ago. Both of them were from the tech industry. The project manager was the same person from our team. Both of them were a theme plus custom design. We do that for clients who have a lower budget. We customize the theme so it looks unique to them. That was the same story here. The designer, each of them brought their own designer. So that design is on top of the theme that we implemented it. And the developer was our same developer on our team. Client number one, Trend Lines, which is a venture capital group, tweeted this, and like not just this, in many cases they kept refer uh, recommending us, you know, big thanks to me, and that's the project manager and our team for our great new website, love us, fabulous, etc. And this is the other client. Oh yeah, unicorns and rainbows there. Right? There, okay. Um, client number two, Really, like, same everything, hated us, thought we were the worst. Um, you know, stormy clouds and all that. So the conclusion is we can only do our best, and so go have a cup of And I'll just tell you that that second client, strangely, um, came back to us for more work. So <laughs> that's also, <laughs> I, I can't explain how people. That? No, we actually didn't. We said yes, <laughs> but, this is okay. We, we, we actually had really raised our prices since then. So, um, <laughs> yeah, so they were like, what happened to your prices? And I was like, well, this is the prices now. And also, you know, doing more work aside from the site. Anyways, I had reasons and, and that's sort of that. <laughs> um, a CRM. How many of you use a CRM? So two people here, just so you all know. Three, four, and me, five. Okay, and we're like, that's, I don't even know if that's, is that 10%? I don't know. But this is generally how it is in a crowd. People don't use a CRM, which is, a, for anyone who doesn't know, customer relationship management system. That sounds really fancy and technical, but really um, it means that you'll know who your clients were, what they hired you for, and you can get all sorts of other data out of it. And um, one of the best ways to get new business is to go back to old clients. Um, and if you aren't tracking your relationships with clients, it's very hard to go back to them, um, to, to offer them new services or just to generally communicate with them. So um, there's, so it's, it's, very, it's definitely worthwhile. And also we've had people who come to us and then really like literally five years later come back to us again. And we have all that information from the first time around. So we're not you know, totally ignorant um, and in the dark about them. Um, and uh, it's the more the more and better you use a CRM, the more information you have, and information is power. You really can use it um, to do good things for your business. So, oh, this is just like stats like you guys. How many are using CRM out of a workforce of 3.4 billion? 15 million, 0.5% penetration. So here it's actually better, good job. <laughs> um, yeah, and this is another study showing how many are using CRM. So here are just some options. Um, Salesforce is one of the reasons people don't start using a CRM because it's so huge and expensive. Every move you make costs you money. If you want to add on anything, it costs you money. And it's got so many options, like small, medium-sized businesses, like uh, most of ours, really don't need that. So you can ignore Salesforce. Microsoft Dynamics, I'm just telling you it's there. I don't know anything about it. Um, Sugar CRM is open source. People really like it. Um, Nimble and Batchbook are interesting. They have a lot of social integration. So you can get a lot of information about a person's um, online presence when you start communicating with them. Um, and kind of like Reportive. Do you guys use Reportive? If you're not, you should totally use it. It's like Big Brother, but it's so fantastic. You can really know, you know so much about a person that you're communicating with as soon as you have their email address. So Nimble and Batchbook work similarly. Um, Zoho CRM is actually the one that we use. We've been using it for like seven years. And it's not so cool. The UI is not beautiful. So at one point I started checking out other things, but we came back to it because it's really what a CRM should be. 
leads, opportunities, you know, um, uh, quotes, we use it mainly for leads, opportunities, and contacts. And you can add custom fields to your heart's content. There's no limitations there. It's free for up to three users. So if you're a small, if you're a small team, there's no risk there. Um, you can export your content at any time. It integrates, okay, we have, we actually set up on our site, um, and for other clients, an integration between Gravity Forms, which we use on every site, love it, with Zoho CRM, right? Gravity Forms, yeah, <laughs> it's the best, it's for the win. So um, there's actually a plugin that we, we pay for, it's premium, but it's so worth it. Um, our lead forms on our site um, feed directly into Zoho CRM as new leads. And then we don't have to do any manual work and it's all there and then we can go through the leads and deal with them like that. So um, not only do I recommend the host CRM, but at a certain point I found out that I'm actually on their homepage. <laughs> I tweeted at one point that I think they have a good service and then, well, there I was on their homepage and I think I might still be there. So <laughs> it's kind of amusing for me. But um, I highly recommend starting to get that discipline of tracking your people, tracking your projects. What we also do in Zoho CRM is we enter the value of projects that is projected and also once they're signed, so we can then run reports based on that. You know, how many clients signed on this month or how many leads and what value were this month. And you can, you can do all sorts of reports. It's, it's very customizable and their support is actually good. It's in India, so some people have said, well, it's in India, I don't think I should use them. And I'm like, well, they always answer us and they answer us well, so um, that's them. Being prepared for growth. This is human resources, which uh, we were talking about before. We're laughing. Anyways, um, hiring. We now, again, are in this situation, and we've been there before, which is we get more projects than we can handle. Um, hiring is very, very difficult. It really is, I think, an art and a science in some ways, and uh, I actually don't have any advice for you guys on that. <laughs> it's like hit and miss with me and my team. I have one person who's been with me for basically eight years and she's amazing. Rebecca Markowitz, yay! She's the best. And then it's been very hard to hire other people who have that longevity and also have that level of knowledge. It's like a very interesting set of skills that a person needs in order to be a WordPress project manager, um, which is what we, we need the most someone who gets the real nuts and bolts of WordPress, gets UI, user interface and user experience, understands CSS, understands some JavaScript, you know, um, even SEO, right? We try to make sure that all our sites are built in a way that they're optimized at least um, infrastructurally for search and social marketing. I mean, where are those people? I don't know. But um, <laughs> yeah, so we're, we're looking to hire again. Uh, in order to fulfill our projects which are coming in. Um, but just, yeah. one thing that I have learned about hiring is that um, people, well this is what I used to think. We're based in Jerusalem. The, you might have heard about Israel, it's been recently called the startup nation because uh, per capita I think it has the most startups in the world. Um, and, but most of the startups are concentrated in the Tel Aviv area. And it's not that far away, it's an hour away, but it's like, Two different worlds, and um, because the startup activity is there, the best hum the best workers are also in the Tel Aviv area. So I would think, well, we have to provide or offer a salary that's similar to what the startups are offering in Tel Aviv. But there's no way we can do that. Those startups are are backed by venture capital and investors and who knows what. And um, and just being in Jerusalem, the economy there is is different. We just we can't do that. So I did learn that um, what workers want is they want to get paid properly, and they should get paid properly, but if you can offer them other things, then, then they're happy to work for you. Like, uh, we are a lot of mothers, um, and we had a father. We're a lot of women on the team. <laughs> um, so if I can offer them flexibility, you know, if the kid is sick, or the kid in Israel, like every week the kid is having some kind of party in their kindergarten, so, you know, so they can go to that party. Um, the Jewish holidays, you know, they're long, like Passover, and just understanding all of that, um, that is something that's very valuable because people want to work but they also need to be able to meet their family's needs. Um, the opportunity to learn, if you can uh, give, if you get hire the right people, they want to learn. And then if you can give them that opportunity, the space to learn new things and be on new and interesting projects, then that is also motivating. Um, 
and respect is actually a huge thing. Um, people ask me sometimes what the hierarchy is in our business, and um, I am the boss, right? At the end of the day, I'm the one who calls the shots, but I don't see myself as better or higher than my than my team members. I see them as my team members, and uh, the way I that way we talk to each other is as team members. So um, giving workers respect, hearing what they have to say, and um, giving them the opportunity to express opinions and give insight is, is very valuable and, um, and motivating as well. Oh, so that just, I didn't explain why I'm called the friendly CEO. I was the co-CEO, my, my co-CEO also recently left, so I'm, I'm back as the whole CEO. Um, but the reason I'm called friendly CEO, just FYI, um, is because uh, Rebecca has been working with me for so long I, in the beginning, I didn't really have a title, and it kind of got awkward because people were like, "Who are you? What are you doing?" And I was just like, "Oh, I'm Miriam." So that wasn't great. So, um, but I didn't want to call myself CEO because I thought that sounded too, I don't know, elitist. You know, I'm not Bill Gates or Steve Jobs or something. So she said, "Call yourself Friendly CEO." And I was like, "Okay." And it's always a good conversation starter. People look at my business card and they're like, "Friendly CEO." Yeah, and then they're like, "What do you think? I'm not friendly." <laughs> oh no, you're friendly. You're friendly. <laughs> Um, so in terms of this uh, HR issue, one thing is to try to collect freelance talent. Um, whenever I see someone with talent in Israel or like on one of the groups who says that they do WordPress work, I contact them and I get their details. Freelance workers though are very, um, they have their own issues, right? Because they're not completely dedicated to you. They have a million other things on their head. They generally have too many projects that they're working on at the same time. So they've also had their own issues, but it's really good for overflow. In certain cases, you can find someone who's reliable. So that's another thing. Okay, and then the other thing about hiring is firing, which I'm so bad at, but I'll just tell you that it's really important. I will dra drag things on rather than tell someone that they need to go. I, I think I'm kind of better at it, but I still actually, no, I'm not. I'm really bad. So, but if you're working with someone, like as a small business, your biggest expense, the biggest drain on the business is human resources. That's how it is for us. We're a services-based business and, and the salaries are just, and it is in Israel, you have to pay all sorts of additional benefits, like a lot. It can get to 30% um, uh, more added to the salary. So um, if you've got someone like that on your team and they're bringing the team down or not doing what they're supposed to do, then it's really important to cut cut that as fast as possible. Um, so it's it's important for everyone. Like um, there's a, a guy in Israel who started a company called Soyota, which eventually was bought. His name is Naftali Bennett. Now he's a member of the of the parliament. And he wrote a, a startup guide. It's really excellent. And he says, don't forget that as long as you're keeping, you know, you think you're being sympathetic to that person, but you're actually putting everyone else on your team at risk because if they're being a drain on the business, everyone's jobs are at risk. So you know, you have to keep that in mind. Finding your price. Oh, pricing. So that's like the big question for all of us, right? Because people come to us and they say, well, my nephew can build me a site for, let's say, 1,000 Rand. And it's open source, so it's free, right? Isn't that what open source means? And so why do you cost so much? Um, other things that we hear, I read that WP and WordPress is easy, so can't you just add this feature, we actually have a song in the office, the Just Just song. Can't you just, and then we go just to just just, you know, and we, and the clients, you know, whatever. <laughs> the just. So can't you just add this feature? So you will always cost more and less than others, pretty much. I mean, unless you price yourself rock bottom or like way out of the park, you will always cost more and less than others, and that is totally fine. It's important to find what your market allows and also your type of client allows, um, and trying to stick within that range, and you can figure it out, and you can definitely be on the higher end, but how do you justify that? So this, this is um, an equation, which I'm not gonna go through right now, but first of all, you have to figure out how much you must charge per hour. It's basically an equation of how many billable hours there are per month. Yes, someone works 40 hours a week, but out of those 40 hours, 10 are spent, on meetings, you know, team meetings, and five were spent on lunch breaks, and then there's vacation days in there, right? And like, how many billable hours do you really have left among your team? And how much do you have to be charging to cover your costs? Uh, so this 
Um, I'll make available after. Um, it's just an equation to figure out what your base price should be. But how can you charge more than that? By differentiating yourself. Oops. There. So um, I knew at one point that I wanted to take us to the next level. People, the sites we were building were okay, but they were mostly template-based and they, they didn't look great like from a design point of view. So we took on two gigantic projects that we had never taken on before. And um, we lost a ton of money on both those projects. But once we had those in our portfolio, then we could show them to other people and show that we were a serious company. The best selling point that you can have, aside from referrals, is your portfolio. And um, potential clients are always looking for all sorts of things. They're looking for the level of design, or the features, or some clients want to see that you've done projects in their industry or their field. So the more you can have in your portfolio, the better. Every project is not just revenue for you, it's also a stepping stone to your next project. And if you can, so at that point we, we could do that loss because we had investors and whatever. Like, so it, it helped us get through that. Um, and it's really risky. But once you take that leap, and it will cost you because you're gonna be doing things you've never done before, you know, you're gonna make terrible mistakes and have to fix all sorts of crazy things. And that's what it was for us. Um, once it goes live, you've got something great to show. You've also learned a lot. And then your next project can also be something on that level. Um, in terms of, of pay, like getting uh, projects with good budgets, so it's, it's hard, but it's important to look beyond the small like solopreneurs type thing um, and the very small businesses and organizations. You, you need to get to bigger companies and bigger organizations who actually like have budgets, you know, they have, they, they're organized, they have, they have a marketing budget and then some of it is allotted to the website and they have greater awareness and they actually really want to invest in making sure that the final product is high quality. So, um, and in order to do that, you need to differentiate yourselves and one way, one of the ways is taking a sleep. And the other are these types of things where, you know, you teach, organize, right? Organize meetups, organize work camps, uh, publish articles, blog posts, and things like that. And just generally taking, you know, giving them that extra, extra bonus on their site that wows them or extra service. Um, and then, you know, that helps get you to that next level. So that's what I want to talk about. And, um, I'm happy to take any questions you guys have. Um, and yeah, that's uh, what I have to say about that. You mentioned about firing staff, but what about uh, firing clients? Have you ever been in that, that position where you had to say, sorry, we can't work with you? Or so the question is about firing clients. Yeah. Um, Again, I'm a, I'm a wuss about firing anybody, so in I, the high pricing. That's um, when there's a need to cut you know, the relationship or, or I knew that things were not going to be positive with the client, then the pricing gets higher. So I'm, I'm not actually, I, but our pricing really is often what it is, <laughs> camera. Um, <laughs> so, so that, but it doesn't happen that often also. It's very rare. I think the last time it happened was like eight years ago. So the pricing gets higher. I've heard. No, I mean, but if, you, if they're a pain in the bum, then they're going to take more time, so you have to price that in. So, of course so that's also your pricing, right, exactly. The pricing isn't coming out of nowhere. It's a very good point. The pricing takes into consideration, okay, this project would take 80 hours to do. Their phone calls at 11 o'clock at night will be another 50 hours, 130 hours right there. You know, so it is based on something. That's true. Any other questions? Yeah. So the uh, clients over five continents. Yeah. Did that just happen organically, or was that just a, was that a conscious step to sort of business in that direction? So the question is about having clients um, on different continents. Um, the Israeli market is very small. The, it's a country of eight million people, so it's very small. And you know, as you can imagine, out of that, how much is potential business for us? So we always, I always wanted to expand outside of Israel um, and get clients outside. But the challenge is that to get someone to pay your higher pricing, they need to know you and trust you. And if you're just another digital, you know, avatar, they don't feel enough confidence to pay you that pricing. So what would happen is we would quote on projects and we would actually be more expensive 
then let's say even in the States, the local freelance developer that they were going to go with or something. Um, so that was problematic. Um, we did get clients anyways, people who found us, we're on CodePoet, they have a directory of developers, so we're there, and uh, WP Engine has a list of like recommended developers or something, so we're there, um, and in a few other places that I can't remember. Oh, uh, with Troy Dean, he did all these podcasts. So as I've become more international, that has helped, and so like, uh, God willing, we're gonna start working with a client in Switzerland, and, and these clients are coming to us because they trust us, but it's very, very difficult to achieve that without, and another thing I learned from WordCamp Europe um, is that nothing beats face-to-face. -face. Like, it really doesn't, I can be on the WordPress forums, and, but even how I feel about people, it's totally different when you're facing them. So, to build that up, I think it really means starting to get out there, which I have been doing, and I'm supposed to speak at SMX London in May. To, I, I would like to expand us into the British market, and hey, that's the first step, you know, things like that. So unfortunately it does demand some kind of travel, some kind of getting out there more. It, it's, it's difficult. Yeah. Hi Miriam, uh, I just about missed this bit. How big is your team? Oh, you didn't miss it, I didn't say it. Uh, we're in a team of seven, yeah. but unfortunately we've been having human resource issues. One of our project managers found it difficult to manage life, you know, family life and work, and so she quit. And my co-CEO also just left the company, so now I have to hire. And Aside from the difficulty of it, it takes so much time. But God willing, we're going to get back to seven once I finish it sounds, up. It sounds like you need to hire someone to hire. Oh, totally. Employee. Well, luckily, my husband has a background in human resources. He actually he doesn't work in that now. He works in solar energy. If anyone, you know, it's very interesting, I think. But um, <laughs> he did work as, in human resources. So what now, when I was looking for the co-CEO, I got all these CEOs, and I'm like, I, I, can't, I, I, I can't even look at these resumes. Like, I don't have time. I can't, I can't do it. So. Um, he helped me like make order and thank God. Uh, my husband's actually um, often not on an ongoing basis, but he gets involved in the business and helps me out um, in very good and useful ways. Yeah. Uh, all your team is stationary, right? It's not distributed. Like well, we're all in Israel, but. Um, we actually were downsizing our office size because what happened was we were all coming into the office all the time. And then, even I don't come into the office all the time. First of all, I'm running out to meetings. And sometimes I just, I get the kids out in the morning, I sit down in front of my computer, and then I don't move. And so, we're like, at any given time, it's like two or three people in the office. So we're actually moving to a smaller office now. And um, I've been inspired by like, like uh, Woo Themes and uh, Automatic and I recently had a conversation with uh, Jake Goldman, who's the founder of TenUp. They have 60 employees, no office. He himself lives in the city where nobody else lives. And they do it. So like, you know, I think it's, it's doable. I didn't used to think so. I do need to have an office because of our children <laughs> that you saw. <laughs> I, like, there's no way I can get work done when they're home. So, so I do need an office. But um, we're becoming more and more virtual even Oh, but by the way, I hear that there's really good developers here, and I'd really like your information. So uh, if you are a good developer, so please let me know, and then we can even become more virtual. <laughs> yeah. So I've been thinking, I, I think about it every once in a while, because I think that those of us who focus on WordPress are at risk. Right? Think about people who focused on Joomla, um, and now people just don't want to go with Joomla, right? And that's their area of expertise. So in Israel, those companies expanded into offering, like they just saw people want WordPress, so they expanded into offering WordPress. Um, at the moment, not because I want us to provide a very good service, and I have learned that you can only provide a very good service in something that you know really well. And to learn another platform would just be, it's just, I can't do it at this point. And also, I truly do believe that in 99% of cases of, that come to us, WordPress is the best solution for them right now. So I don't, I don't see a reason to expand. I mean, if, first of all, I think open source is the only way to go. If we're talking about open source, it's Joomla, Drupal, and WordPress. Joomla, no. Drupal, it's like uh, almost the size of a WordPress project just to get the platform into a state where you can start working on a site. And it's also much more expensive which is good for Drupal developers. They can charge more. But um, I don't think that that's the right decision for a client. 
So right now WordPress is the way to go, in, in my opinion. There's an Israeli company called Wix, which you might have heard of, right? So Wix is uh, based out of Israel. Um, it's very popular, and it is good. Like if a client comes to us and they have like a very low budget and they just need a few pages, I'll be like, go on Wix, you know, get that up there, or WordPress.com. You don't need us, and it's fine. But as soon as they start building a site with 20, 30, 50, 100 pages, and then they're stuck with Wix, and what if they have to move off of Wix? All that 301 redirecting, losing the links, losing the authority, it's just a mess. So, um, so in those cases, I, I really do not believe that Wix is the right solution. So that's, that's why we're sticking with WordPress now. And you have to ask yourself that question every once in a while. Absolutely, it's an honest question that we do have to say, is this right, and are we doing the right thing for our clients, and is this the future? At some point, we may all have to be like, you know, people don't want WordPress anymore, and we have to look for something else. But in the meantime, and WordPress is so strong, backed by Automatic, you know, they are there very strongly in the picture with Nathan um, investing so much time, and that team, and, and just the general community is so large, and, yeah, so I think it's got a good, strong future for like, really, I think like 10 years. Anything else? Yes. Uh, my question is about software similarly, in, in that uh, you've spoken about diversifying. Have you ever thought that, that following the service business in itself, chasing the bigger client, getting bigger budgets, scratching your software, that you find a good employee, have you ever thought like diversifying to the point of using your workplace knowledge and going to plugins or themes? Absolutely. Yes, so, and my husband is constantly, at least once a month he reminds me that we should really be developing a product. <laughs> so yes, we absolutely should be developing a product, but the nature of our service business is that we're, if, if uh, one of the employees has time to put towards a billable project that will actually get paid, you know, at a certain date and bring in revenue to the business which we need, that's where their time has to go. We just don't have the resources, and I have ideas. I have lists of ideas of things that we should develop, but like to get around to it is, I mean, that's just, I find it very difficult. But uh, if someone can get into that, I totally think it's the way to go. You still have to give support, but um, it's, it's not the same. A lot of it is repetitive and uh, you can have knowledge base and all this kind of, I think it's, uh, I think it's the way to go if you can do it. Yeah. Uh, would you recommend a client service-based business model to someone who's not a business? Would I, would I say they should go to the same business? I actually... Are you? If you can, build a product. Seriously, build a product. You'll have a lot less gray hairs than I do at this point. And uh, you'll get to spend more time with your kids, hopefully, you know? Um, yeah, and my husband has an opinion on the matter which he'd like to share with you. <laughs> so firstly, hi guys. Um, yeah, I'm definitely not an, an, a WordPress expert. Um, I need, you know, from the business side watching where you've developed the business. Um, I mean, to, to me, also being involved in a couple of businesses, myself, founding businesses, um, your, your number one decision is, do you want to be an entrepreneur? There is no easy business. And yes, it sounds cool to go into products, and I do encourage it if you can. But there's a couple of key issues, and the first one is, are you, are you built, and are you, are you absolutely passionate about what you're doing? Because you're going to have ups and downs, no matter what you do products or, or service. The second issue, which I think, watching the WordPress community, uh, and, and I've you know, attended some of the WordPress events, you can just see that you know, the industry needs to become a lot more commercial for sustainability. You, know, you guys are passionate, you love the, the platform, but there's a whole bunch of core business skills. I mean, just look at the finance issue. Most of the questions you're asking really can be solved with capital. And I think that a lot of the businesses uh, in the industry are undercapitalized. And you, you're blaming yourself and it's really tough. It's really not about you. You're brilliant at what you do, but you do need capital. Businesses need capital. And you need to hook up with venture capitalists. You need to, maybe as a community, raise the profile of WordPress 
and go and have a dialogue with the financial investment institutions that are, are, are in Cape Town. And, you know, I know. I, you know, I know that there's a lot of guys here who are looking for great businesses. They just don't know anything about WordPress. That it hasn't been presented to them as a business and investment opportunity. So, yeah, so, so I, I would recommend, highly recommend that for the global industry and definitely uh, for you guys to, to really think about that, maybe start uh, start a bit of a dialogue with um, uh, you know high net worth individuals and investors uh, based here. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, plenty plenty of uh, interesting stuff here, and I I, I really want uh, want to help and support Ruth's business because also I, I'm getting through her. I'm getting really excited about the industry. And uh, yeah, there's, there's definitely ideas if anyone wants to have this you know, ongoing discussion, I'm, I'm happy to have that as well. Um, the, pa the thing about having a passion for what you do is really important. And that's, you know, now that Danny mentioned it, it's one of the reasons why I haven't made the push also to develop a product because I do love building a website. I love that creation, I love when it launches, I'm so proud of it. It is a creative endeavor and it's very satisfying. And yes, uh, a product is, but you're doing the same thing. There's obviously a creative element there, but for me, I just, I really love that that uh, creativity that's involved in the website. So you do need to be passionate about it, and yes, every business has a it. So. Any other questions? Yes. Um, has anything else come of it in terms of what? Oh, so um, actually, I think that there's going to be another think tank coming up um, in the next few months. Uh, Troy's already talking about that. So, in terms of actual, like, practical on the ground, nothing has happened since then. We're going to continue the conversation. Um, but what I do see in, uh, like, for example, on, on one of the LinkedIn groups, there's a question, how do you explain WordPress to your clients? And a lot of people were saying that their clients don't actually care if, if they're using WordPress. And actually in Israel, it's not the case. Um, I don't know why. It might be because there's like more of a technological bent even to marketing managers there. But, or also a lot of people have been burnt by other by other systems that when it comes time to do the new website, the, the marketing manager says, this company needs WordPress. And then they go out looking for good WordPress providers. So we get very targeted clients who are specifically looking for WordPress. And I guess it's not the case everywhere. It's the same, yeah. it's the same, Is it the same here? Yeah. That's really good. That's a really big advantage if you can position yourself well in like locally as excellent WordPress developers then you've already got them. Like the, you know, they, they know they need you, they just need to choose who. So uh, I think it's going to be a matter of time, but yeah, maybe there should be a concerted effort to raise the bar, make WordPress um, make people understand that it is an enterprise solution. I mean we do build enterprise websites and many companies do and there's many examples and yet still you sometimes find yourself having to convince clients that it's not just for blogs. So it's, it's a matter of time, but I see things changing tremendously already. Anything else? Yeah? Do you have somebody dedicated to support on your side? So at the moment, I, I provide support and uh, Rebecca provides support and uh, any other project manager that's working on a project provides support for their client. Um, so it's split but it's split, uh, but me and Rebecca get the brunt of it, and it's difficult. Would it be a strategic group on your part to, like, in the near future, get somebody who has just catered for support so that you guys can focus on your new projects? So I spoke about that uh, maintenance, hosting and maintenance thing, and one of the things that I was thinking about, and I am thinking about, is if we move it off to just maintenance, um, I'm thinking, okay, we can add value by, let's say, uh, you know, uh, 
putting all of our clients in Vault Press, or there's another one called Code Guard, right? And and maybe uh, Security or or WordFence Premium. You know, add some extra value, increase our pricing, and increase our pricing above that, so that we can maybe have someone dedicated to support because it is it's it's sucking a lot of time and it's holding us back on other projects. But on the other hand, you can't. One of the reasons we start providing support is because if you launch a site and you leave the client hanging, they will hate WordPress, hate their site, and then not recommend you or WordPress to anyone else. So for the for your future work, you need to provide the support in some way. It's a matter of finding out how. But yeah, I would definitely consider at some point having a dedicated support person. Anything else? Okay, well, those are great questions. Thank you. It was really fun talking to you guys. I hope you got some value out of this. And uh, I'm, I thank you again for giving me the excuse to get out of Joburg and get away with my husband. <laughs> That's from the kids. So, oh, yeah.